for today, we are going to talk about all things gardening, home gardening, vegetables, maybe some fruits, all those good things at home. Um, we really want it to be an interactive Q&A. We do have some topics to kind of go over, but if there are any questions that you have, we would love all those questions throughout the time. Feel free if you're eating lunch to keep your camera off if you would like or turn your camera on. We'd love seeing all of your faces, but we have Megan McGuffey with us today, who is the Executive Director of Community Crops. So Megan, do you wanna give us a little overview of what Community Crops does? Absolutely. Thank you so much for hosting me today. So as Bree said, I'm the Executive Director at Community Crops. And our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and experiences to grow local food. So we're probably best known for our community gardens. We have 11 across the city of Lincoln. Most of them are kind of traditional allotment model. So you apply to garden with us, you put in an application, we place you based on need and availability, and then you pay for your plot on a sliding scale basis. And that kind of becomes your your personal space that you take care of and harvest from. And we also have a training farm, we do vegetable sales, and we do a lot of education for both farmers and gardeners. Awesome. I know I always love hearing about different nonprofits in our community and anything to help me with gardening is also really helpful as well. So I think one of the first biggest questions that anybody usually has with the garden and when they're starting to think about planting things is, do I start with seeds or do I start with the starter plant? I never know which one is better for me. So maybe you could kind of give us some tips and tricks on knowing which is better. Absolutely. It's a great question. And the answer is it depends. So it really depends on the, the plant variety. So your seed packets are going to have a lot of information for you. And I, I think people don't credit them with that enough. So before you buy those packets, flip them over and it changes a little bit for every brand. But what you're looking for is a harvest or maturity date. And that will tell you how long it's going to take that, that plant to get harvestable. And so in Nebraska, with the length of our growing season, uh, you really, anything that's a super warm season crop that needs really long stretches of warm temperature, you're probably going to want to start with a starter plant. So think of like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, those need a really long season. And if we didn't cheat the system a little bit and start them inside or buy them as plants, they just wouldn't make it to harvest. Uh, things that have shorter seasons or don't mind cool temperatures are good candidates for starting from seeds. So things like radishes, lettuce, spinach, things like that are very easy to start from seeds. And with any of your plants, uh, you know, there's a lot of range within a single type. So let's take tomatoes, like your cherry tomatoes could be ready in 55 or 60 days. You know, if you get a big beefsteak tomato, it could take 90 days. So you really want to read those packets carefully, no matter what type of plant it is. Um, and this is really true, especially for the cool season crops. So things like lettuce, I mentioned, you know, if there's a, a lettuce plant that says it's going to take 90 days to get harvestable, we don't have enough cool season for that to really bear out unless you start it inside. So it, it's a lot of customizing and there are great guides online that will help you not only know when to start your seeds, but also to help you determine if you start it inside or outside. So what are some things that I might need if I'm going to start it inside? Yes, the basics would be containers and you can really be pretty creative here. Anything from like pots you make out of newspaper to the traditional plastic pots or recyclables. You'll need a soil medium. Uh, it, there's, there's a lot of different ways people like to do this, but there's often seed starting specifically soils that you can buy at the store. Um, your seeds and then lights are really critical. So I think a lot of people like kind of a, a rookie mistake is you want to start it in the window and you think the window is pretty sunny. When seedlings are that small, they will bend towards the light. They're really light sensitive. So uh, it's really good. It doesn't have to be an expensive, fancy grow light. It could be like a cheap shop light, but you want to keep it three or four inches above your plants because that keeps them nice and stocky rather than kind of stretching toward the light source and making weaker plants. That's super helpful because I definitely would have put them in the window. <laughs> and occasionally you can get away with it, but you'll have much better results if you just invest in some inexpensive lights. <laughs> I love it. I love it. 
Um, now, thinking about where we're going to be gardening, I know container gardens have been a huge hit. And especially with the pandemic starting last year, I think a lot of people got into gardening and wanted to start small with some con container gardens. So kind of talk us through what is best to grow in a container garden. I think these are great for apartments. I know I started out with a container garden when I lived in an apartment and I loved it. So what kind of grows best in a container garden? Yes, we have had to learn a lot about container gardening with the pandemic because we've always had these big garden and farm spaces, but you're right, it's such an in-demand topic and it also really makes gardening accessible to everybody. So for containers, the good news is you can grow almost anything in a container. Like the, the probably the exceptions just for practical purposes would be things like corn or okra where they're like 12 feet tall and you need a certain number of them for it to really get a, a quantity that would be harvestable but almost everything else you can grow in a container. Uh, the things to consider with your container, I would go for something that's at least like a five gallon bucket size, unless you're talking about something very small like herbs or carrots of certain varieties. So look for a larger container like that uh, and really make sure there are drainage holes because the big difference between container gardening and in-ground gardening is the watering is a lot less forgiving. You have to water more frequently, but you also don't want to accidentally drown your plants because there's the roots are sitting in water in the bottom. So whatever you buy, either it should already have holes or you should be prepared to drill or nail holes into it. Uh, and then the, the soil, there's great raised bed mixes and all sorts of easy ways to find soil for your containers. For plant varieties, the main thing I recommend is to look for things that are labeled patio or bush varieties. These are specific ones that have been um, bred so that they are smaller and more compact. So they're gonna be very happy in a container and they're not gonna end up as this big crazy thing that you're trying to keep control of that, that's really trying to go beyond the bounds of the container. And I would also plan ahead when you plant, if you can find a trellis, you know, because whether it's a little tomato cage or something else that you construct, because if you install that at the beginning, it'll be a lot easier when your tomato or whatever starts to get big, you don't have to try to like, retrofit something on there. I feel like that's definitely happened to me before. <laughs> <laughs> <All of us. laughs> um, Bree had a really good question. Is a grow light different than maybe if you had an extra desk lamp laying around? Could you use that? It's a great question. As long as you can keep it adjusted so that you maintain that like two to four inch distance between the plants and the light, uh, it'll work to start. A lot of this comes down to the, the available light spectrum and then how intense that light is. So, uh, you know, a, a basic light like a shop light or a, a lamp that you would have in the house doesn't have the full light spectrum. So for seed starting, it's fine because you're only keeping them inside for a few months and then they're going to go out into the sunlight and get the full light spectrum. Um, but if you were trying to grow something to maturity, like you wanted to have a little cherry tomato or something like that in the house, that is not going to give it everything it needs to really be fully productive. So that's kind of the limit there. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is depending on how fancy your light is and how bright your light is, that kind of determines how many hours of light per day. So at home, I use kind of, like I said, the cheap fluorescent tube shop lights, and I have to keep those on about 14 hours a day to make sure those plants get what they need. If you wanted to pay for something a little bit more expensive that has a fuller light spectrum and a little bit better intensity, you might not need to have the lights on so constantly like that. I'm pretty sure you could find my house in my neighborhood at any, any time after like 9 p.m. this time of year because it's just like a beacon. So, so it's whatever works for you, but I just recommend kind of like starting with the inexpensive stuff, you know, get, get your, dipping your toe, toe into the water and then you can always like invest and experiment with different lights over time. So the type of light bulb doesn't necessarily matter. It's just the amount of light that it's getting. Is that correct? Right, right. And the distance from the plant. And there are great charts online where you can kind of look up like for this wattage and this type of light, this is how many hours of light my plant probably needs. And it's more art than science, but just kind of, you know, keep a close eye on your plants and see what they need and, and, and use those resources online and you'll be able to adjust from there. You know, Megan, you said something super great that I think is always helpful before we start is that we learn more from the plants we kill than the ones that we grow, which is so true. 
<laughs> yes, it's so true. And I'm still killing plants all the time. I want everyone to know that. So I think I think gardening sounds so intimidating and we act like people have to be experts to do this, but like everyone can kind of intuitively grow something and you are constantly learning. So even when there are mistakes and missteps, there's something to get out of that. So I would just really encourage folks to not feel like you have to have all the right tools or the perfect setup. Like just try something and see what happens and it'll it'll be a good experiment. It'll be fun. And even if your seeds don't work out, well, luckily there's a lot of plant starters like until May or June. So even if you screw up your seeds, you can still get plants somewhere to still grow something pretty late in the season. So that's always happening. Absolutely. <laughs> So what do you think would be some good things to companion plant together in a container garden? Because we know that there are some things that do not do well together when they're planted next to each other. So especially when you have such big space in a container garden, what would be some plants that would work really well together? Yeah, I think uh, companion planting is like a whole presentation on its own. I would recommend the book uh, Carrots Love Tomatoes if you're really into like pairing things up. I think that's a fun one. And I think the biggest things you're looking for are plants that are diverse enough that they can kind of complement each other. So in that example of carrots love tomatoes, you know, like there are different root levels, there are different nutrient requirements for those plants. So that's how you can kind of uh, group them together. And I think the biggest thing is like, you really won't fit too many things in any one container. So don't get too caught up on that. But um, you know, learn your plant families. And especially, I know a lot of you said you have bigger yards. So when you're putting things in the ground, you really want to be thinking ahead to crop rotation. So there are groups of plant families and they might not be what you think. So like tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and potatoes are all in the same plant family, the nightshades. So if you plant those in the same spot year after year, you're going to start to have issues with disease and pests, and you're just going to kind of stress out the soil health. So uh, that, that's a big thing. And again, I, I'll, I'll say online all the time because there's just so many great resources out there, but you can find really easy guides that will kind of help you group those plants out and start to plan ahead. And I think that will be very helpful as you're getting started. That is super helpful. I know I learned my lesson just this last year because I did not rotate and I definitely did kill off my shishito peppers. So. Always a good lesson to learn again by the things we kill versus the things we keep alive. So, <laughs> um, oh, another great question. How do you keep plants alive when you're gone for a couple of days besides just having someone water them for you? Are there any tips or tricks or things that you can do? That's a great question. Um, I think for in-ground gardening, the biggest thing is to just water deeply rather than frequently. So I think people wanna water every day, especially when it's really hot and that's not super sustainable for you or the plants. And you're also not encouraging deep root growth when you do that. So if you're constantly sort of babying them and giving them little sips of water all the time, then they're not like pushed to like put down deep roots, spread out and try to find water sources. So I myself just water like a few times a week, but I water very, very deeply. Uh, on top of that, you can really do some mulching and that will make a huge difference to your water regulation overall. If your soil is mulched and covered, and, and again, you've got a variety of options here. I like to lay down either cardboard or newspaper and then either put straw on top, grass clippings. Uh, some people even do wood chips if they have that barrier like cardboard in between. But really you just want to always keep the soil covered and that will keep things from drying out as quickly and then your garden is going to be fine if you're gone for a couple of days. Uh, containers it's a little trickier you might need that to phone a friend on that one but again mulching will help and just being strategic about where you place those containers and that will kind of allow them to be a little bit more resilient in face of changing weather conditions and a little bit of neglect once in a while. You bring up a really good point because I have heard you know if you do water them when it's super hot out, they get used to needing that water then. So is there a better time of day when we should be watering? Yes, I think that in the evening or the early morning are the best times to water because you don't wanna do that during the heat of the day when there's stress and that can kind of create leaf burn. And the other thing that I see beginning gardeners do a lot is they like literally water the plant 
and what you're actually watering is the roots. So you really want to keep the water down at root level, water the soil, don't try to splash the plants. And this is another place where mulch really helps you because some plants are very sensitive to different diseases that come through the soil. And so when you're splashing them, when you're watering them, you're making them more susceptible to all those things and you're increasing the chances that something from the soil is going to come up and hit the plant and then potentially spread a disease. So really like just resist the urge. Don't do the like big broadcast water you see people do all the time. Like focus at the base of the plant and if there's mulch that'll help with the splashing issues as well. Super helpful. Would not have known that otherwise. <laughs> um, Jill has a question about how she stirred her seeds um, in small starter soil, low pods. Um, but they've grown, grown tall and are bendy. So is this time to move them outside or when do you know when to bring your plant starters outside? Oh, that's a great question. So a lot of this is going to depend on the variety. If you're talking like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, it's way too cold for them right now. So uh, and I think this is also just the, tr I love that meme of like the 11 seasons of a Midwestern state. Like that's so true in Nebraska. Like we get like that first really warm week and we're like, yeah, gardening, let's get everything out there. And then like, there's a horrible cold snap and it's very traumatizing for us and the plants. So, so like resist the urge and remember that soil temperature is different than air temperature. So our soils take a lot longer to warm up and cool down than the ambient air temperature. So anything that is kind of in those warm season crops, and I would add in like your cucumbers, your squash, things like that, those all really need consistent warm temperatures above 50 degrees day and night. So for those, if you have some of those, you might want to pot them up and give them a little bit longer inside and kind of just help them nurse them through a little bit longer. Uh, and then for anything that's a cold season crop, so like your kales, your cabbages, carrots, uh, peas, things like that, you could go ahead and, and, and uh, kind of push it and put them outside. And I would just recommend you make a plan for what you'll do if it gets cold. So, you know, you can get your old plastic containers and set them on top of the plants. You can buy inexpensive frost cloth or use old sheets, but you really just have to like monitor the temperature and be willing to cover and uncover things if we get that dip. And they say the last frost date in Nebraska is April 30th. I would argue it's somewhere in the first two weeks of May, we'll still have a cold snap. So that's kind of a good thing to keep in mind if you're trying to plan ahead is really most of your plants don't need to go in the garden until mid-May other than those really early season things like your, your greens, your peas, your radishes, everything else just like you have to give it a little bit of time. So I know we're kind of talking, going back and forth with container and, you know, like if you're gardening at home, but I feel like all these things kind of relate to all of that. Um, some good questions that we've been getting is kind of around pests, right? So if you do have a smaller location or even a smaller plot, plot at your home where you're continually planting things over and over, how can you prevent those pests? Or how can you even manage garden pests, whether you're doing indoor or outdoor gardening? Yeah, it's a good question. And when I recommend things like crop rotation, like obviously I'm talking about the ideal and we're all working with the space we have. So you might not be able to like master perfect crop rotation or something like that. And, and that shouldn't prevent you from gardening. Uh, I think important things for soil health, one is just rotation. So even if you have that really small space, you can still choose to move those few items you grow around so that they're not in the exact same spot every year. Uh, another really important thing is to focus on soil health as far as what the amendments you put in the soil. So if you're using a space very intensely, you want to be careful about fertilizing appropriately. And, and I always recommend a good organic fertilizer, follow the instructions on it. Don't overdo it because you don't want all that to wash away. Um, but also really compost is just a fundamental building block to making your garden healthy. You can buy that or you can make it at home with your own compost bin. But I, every year, I add at least like a half an inch to two inches of compost, depending on how good the soil is in a given area. And that's just a great way to kind of sow in those microorganisms and all that healthy activity and add organic matter to your soil. So that'll make a huge difference. Uh, another option would be to add in some cover crops. So these could be kind of a living mulch or they could be something that go in between plantings. 
And this is another strategy. Cover, cover crops are basically crops you grow for the soil's health rather than for you to consume. So uh, there's things like buckwheat, rye, uh, different kinds of peas and oats. And it, when you mix those in, they are really there to help build up the soil and give back versus the taking away that we're doing with our, our veggies. So that's a really good strategy as well. And then for pest, I really think that, um, you know, prevention is the best strategy and early detection. So we, we really try to minimize chemical usage, even organic interventions as much as possible. But I think if you can notice them early, you can do hand picking and throw them in a bucket of soapy water, like things like squash bugs, that's a, a good deterrent. Um, some people like to put like a yellow sticky trap out by sensitive plants so that that it's not going to catch them all right but it's going to let you know ooh, that's in my garden now i better watch out for that and do something about it um, and then another inexpensive option is row cover um, floating row cover so it looks very similar to frost cloth it's just a difference of how much light it lets through and and the insulation there but that's really great for things like uh like kale and cabbage those are super sensitive to certain insect pressures and um, if you put that cloth over it, because they're not something that needs to have pollinators hitting it during the right times of day, uh, that's a good way to prevent insects without having to spray anything. So those are just a few options, uh, but yeah, happy to answer any more specific questions. If you have a, a particular pest you hate, I, I'd love to get into that. <laughs> I think that kind of brings us to a good place to talk about if you do have a home in, or a larger space outside to be able to garden, how do I know if I should be doing maybe like a container or like a raised bed garden or putting the plants into the ground? Yeah, uh, there's a few things that'll help you decide on this. One is just sort of cost and time. So raised beds uh, take a little bit more work up front to build them. They're, you have to get the right materials and, and like things like lumber are very expensive right now with the pandemic. Uh, and then also just knowing that that's an ongoing commitment. Every few years, you're going to have to fill those beds. You're going to have to repair or replace them. So, you know, nothing's forever and just make sure you're, you're ready for that. And always start small and expand over time. I, I think that's my number one tip with any garden. Uh, and so raised beds are really best if you are, for a couple of reasons, one would be if your soil is a really bad quality. And this could be anything from just like, oh, it's a lot of clay, or I don't really like what's going on with it, to like it's dangerous. So if you have lead or arsenic contamination, for example, and you can do an expensive soil test, you really are like digging up samples around your yard, you're throwing it in a Ziploc baggie and putting it in the mail to a local lab like Midwest Labs and they can kind of help you test to see if there's any problems with your soil. Uh, you can also kind of talk to your local health department because this, this sometimes depends on historical data and certain parts of town maybe have more exposure potential than others. So that's one reason to do a raised bed where it's like absolutely and if you're in that situation you might even put a barrier between the bottom of the bed and the soils um, so, that, so that you're not having that contamination cross through. Uh, another great reason for raised beds is they're just easier. So, you know, when you're in ground, like whatever weed pressure, whatever is going on there, like you have to deal with that from day one. And so if you're looking for a manageable project, a raised bed is a nice way to sort of like control the world a little bit, your little gardening universe and, and keep it a little bit easier. Um, and they're also great if you have anyone in your family that has mobility issues, or maybe if you have little kids and they want to be able to easily reach in and work in the garden. You can really customize the size and shape of raised beds. So I think that's a really positive trait as well. In-ground is a lot faster and a lot cheaper and you are able to truly build like soil health. So if you're really concerned about kind of that give back and building that environmental quality, I think I recommend in-ground. Um, and you just have to work on it over time. Like I've had the same garden plot for seven years now and some of my beds are just now getting to the point where they're really pleasant to deal with because every year I've been adding compost. I've been careful about my management. So so yeah, I just know it won't be a perfect day one no matter what you choose, but it is a gradual process over time. And I think the other thing I would mention with raised beds, because I see this come up a lot in gardening groups and forums, is you cannot fill your raised bed completely with compost. You need a compost soil mix. Otherwise it'll be kind of like the nutrients will be out of whack and it'll be a little stressful for your plants. So Compost is very good and we want lots of compost, but you do need some actual soil on those beds too. And a lot of places will sell you, sell you like a 50-50 mix. So look out for that. Yeah, and just kind of like 
Bree also said is doing those raised beds can be really expensive up front. Like Megan said, the lumber is super expensive because of the pandemic, you have to get the dirt and the compost and the soil and all the things. It can add up really quickly. Um, so even just trying it in ground first, if your soil is able to handle that is always great. Um, you can always start out with one, see how it goes and kind of build your beds throughout um, the years as well. But um, Megan, can you kind of talk a little bit about, do I need to till my yard? I know that that's been something that I've thought, I've never tilled my yard and so far my plants have been okay, but as I'm starting to expand my garden, do I need to till it? Yeah, great question. And this is another place where there's like the best practice and there's also like the practical, like don't feel bad about just doing what you need to do. So we generally recommend against tilling because Soil is a living thing and it has layers and it has structure. So what happens when you use mechanical tillage is you are completely turning over those soil layers and disrupting all the life that is in that soil. And so that is ultimately going to cause a decline in your soil health. And that's really repeat tillage over an extended period of time. So I also want to be clear that like, you know, when you first install a garden and you're dealing with like very compacted grass or something like that, you might need to break out a tiller because otherwise you'd be out there for like years trying to turn the soil. So like, again, don't feel bad about like using something like that to get you started. But I do think it's a nice, a nice story in the end that you don't need this big expensive piece of equipment every year. Um, really, if you keep adding compost, you can hand turn up a lot. And I also recommend hand turning up your soil because it's a great gauge of how much commitment you really have, how big your garden can really be, right? So like, because I always tell people like the garden you wanted in April is not the garden you're going to want to have in July, right? When there's like weed pressure and it's hot and you're tired and you want to go on vacation. So like when you put in this huge garden, which you can do so easily with a rototiller, it's not necessarily realistic. So that's another reason I recommend um, hand tilling. If you're hand tilling, really all you need is a pitchfork or a shovel and you're just loosening the soil and then maybe adding a layer of compost and kind of breaking that smooth over the top. Uh, if you really want to get fancy, there's a tool called a broad fork, and that is like a super big pitchfork, basically. <laughs> so, and it's just a little bit more designed for like ease of use so that um, you're using the tool and you're using your body weight rather than you having to like mechanically do everything. So, um, but that's really for a larger garden or if you're like very into the garden gadgets, but really a pitchfork or a shovel. And again, you're loosening things, you're breaking them up, but you are not flipping that soil because that's how you disrupt the soil layers. You know, I remember um, we now have this thing called mowing to growing and they have some great videos on, you know, hand tilling and things like that. So I'm going to put the link to some YouTube videos in there. Um, Megan, can you also kind of talk about when do I need to add compost and do I need to add fertilizer? What's the best kind of soil? Because there is a million types of soils in the store. So if I am doing a container garden or you know needing to supplement my soil at home, how do I know what's the best for me? Yeah, that's a great question. And thanks for sharing mowing to growing because a lot of the things we're talking about today, we have videos or we will in the future. So that, that's like, if you wanna know container gardening, I'll go through step-by-step -step seed starting, same thing. Um, for soil specifically, you know, compost, really any compost is going to be fine if it's labeled as such. And we always recommend organic whenever possible. But as long as, you know, it, it, is, it is a fully mature compost, it's ready to go. And that's usually what you will buy in the store bag. Uh, you can also, a low cost option is get Lengro from the city of Lincoln. So that is them composting all of our yard clippings and things that go to the city dump. And so I believe it's either free or very cheap if you go pick it up yourself and in, in, in your own truck, or I even know people who like, maybe they only have a car, so they bring a bunch of five gallon buckets and fill it up that way, whatever works for you. So that's a great resource. Uh, there's also companies like Big Red Worms and, and others locally, but any, any garden center should have a compost option. Uh, I don't think this will apply to a whole lot of you, but sometimes people want to use manure, which is a great resource. So if you know someone with like cows, horses, chickens, uh, the only thing I would caution you is like when something is first uh, 
first put out into the world like that, it is like hot. It, so it is, it's a very like hot, like nitrogen, it'll burn your plants. It's, it's too intense for them. So you do need to compost those things. And you'll notice that in the store, like a lot of times you can buy composted cow manure and that's just really saying, okay, we've done, we've given it the time it needed to cool off if you will, so that it's safe to apply to your garden. Uh, and as far as when to apply, I would say at least once a year, either in the spring or the fall. So you either want to start before you get your plants in, or you can actually use that as like a fall technique to prep your garden for the following spring. That's super helpful. Um, I feel like a lot of people may be looking for new homes or have recently purchased new homes and maybe they have some old beds there. And so can you use that old soil? Is it still good to use? Would you recommend adding more like new soil in? What's the best kind of thing to go with that? Yeah, I think for a, a lot of this will just be like, get out your shovel, put it in the soil and you're looking for a couple of things. Like if it's that dark, rich color, and it like literally it smells like soil if that makes sense then like you're probably okay i always would add at least a little bit of compost again just a thin layer to get you started is always going to be a good thing every season and that's that's not as expensive as trying to like completely replace the soil or add a really thick layer um, and then if the soil is really compacted it's really hard to break up it's really tending towards clumps or you can see a lot of clay in there that's when I would say it's more of a requirement that you add compost and other things and that you add them at a more intense level. And if you really, if the soil is very unfamiliar to you or you're starting for the first time, that's when a soil test might be helpful just to let you know what you're working with. But again, I think it's also okay to experiment and just add a little compost and monitor things and your plants will tell you very quickly if the environment is good for them or if you need to take some additional steps. Okay, now I think the most important question, because we all need a quick win, because so many of us feel like we don't have a green thumb. So what are some of the hardiest, easiest plants that I can grow, but also what are some of the most finicky plants that I can kind of keep away from those? Or if I need a challenge, can try them? That's such a good question. Uh, you know, I think tomatoes are probably one of the easiest, thankfully, because I think that's very popular. Uh, and I would say within the tomato world, there's, you know, you're, you're looking for a combination of flavor and hardiness, right? So there's a lot of hybrid tomatoes out there and you'll see like little interesting mystery letters on your plant tags and those are trying to tell you something. So there's things like V and F and those are telling you they're resistant to certain diseases and problems. So if you have really struggled in the past or you think there might be a problem with your soil, I would pick something like that that is like is just designed to really help you out. Um, lettuce is another super easy one. You can literally just like throw the seeds down and they will figure it out. Um, and so th those are probably the two easiest I can think of. Um, the hardest for me personally would be anything in the squash family. And this is really because of the pest pressure. So like um, there's something called the squash vine bore, and that is actually going to um, bore into the stem of your zucchini, your pumpkins, whatever, and it will put its eggs in there and you will not even know something went horribly wrong until like the whole plant collapses because it's these little worms are eating it from the inside out. And like, I got to a place for like my piece. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna support a local farmer and buy my squash at the farmer's market because I don't need that energy in my life. So some people have success with them, some people don't, but um, yep, yep, I see Amber's has that same experience maybe. Um, and you'll see the squash bugs and the little creatures on the leaves and that's what you'll think is the problem and they can be a problem, but there's this beautiful, horrible little moth that actually is laying those eggs and that's the real problem. So again, that's where like using row cover strategically and still making sure the flowers get um, pollinated, that can be something, or if you're just willing to do a little bit more work or you have a big area where you can plant a lot of them, so you can just let nature take a few of them and it'll be okay with you. Uh, that's that's what I would recommend. So yeah, personal vendetta of mine, I don't grow those. So. <laughs> I did try zucchini last year and I got a ton of zucchini until those squash wars hit. And then yes, it just falls over and dies. And you're like, what happened? I was, I cared for you. I did so well. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, and, and some things too, it's good to plant in waves. So like zucchini or cucumbers are good examples. Like they have a little shorter season and they are susceptible to certain diseases. Cucumbers that will often happen, like super easy to grow. You'll have a great early season. And then all of a sudden the leaves are gonna start to turn colors and you're gonna see these little yellow ladybugs on there. And you're gonna be like, what's that about? And then like, you'll see a very rapid decline. So another strategy can be succession planting so that when like the first couple start to have problems, there's follow-up plants. But yeah, you just kind of have to figure out what you like the most and that it's, can you make it worth it to kind of learn those problems? and learn how to treat them in advance. And also how much space you have, because some of those things like squash plants or I tried watermelon one year, take up so much space. So knowing how much space, which usually is labeled on the seed packets, right? But if you're getting it from a seed plant, how do you know how much space it's going to take up? Absolutely. And again, look on your like major seed companies like Johnny's and things like that. They'll kind of have general spacing requirements. Um, and there are like apps and things if you want help plotting out your garden that you can use. The other thing that is is kind of tricky, there's not too many plants to supplies for, but it is good to be aware of. Some plants require two to fruit. So the one that we get all the time at the crops plant sell where we've actually tried to start selling them in pairs is tomatillos. You have to have two of those for them to cross pollinate so that they will fruit. And that is like the saddest thing when someone tries to buy just one and you're like, no, wait. Like, so we're trying to sell them in pairs. But so look out for that information and just do your homework and read your, again, so much is on the seed packet or the plant tag and just make sure you, you check that information. Same thing with fruit trees. Some are self pollinating, some require companions. So, you know, don't, don't invest in something that will not be successful without a buddy. So check that out. Do you want to talk a little bit about the plant cell, Megan? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of Community Crops' big fundraiser, big fundraisers every year. So our annual plant cell is going to be uh, this year it's going to be online. You're going to pre-order everything and then it'll be a drive-through contactless pickup and we're just doing that again because of the pandemic. Uh, in the future we hope to reopen for some in-person sales. But uh, April 26th through the 30th our online store will be open. You can get your order in and then those pickup dates will actually be May 6th to 8th because again it's going to be too cold and we want you to get those plants when they're ready to go in the ground. I know I love getting the majority of my plants from community crops um, with your plant sale and everything. And it is a super easy process of just ordering them all online. And then you just drive up and they put them in your car and you're off to go and then you can plant them. So it is super helpful and easy. I put that link to the more information in there. The only thing it will say is check within the first couple of days because everyone loves the plant sale. So things can go fast. So you really want some good plants, definitely check those out. They have vegetables and fruits, but also some um, different types of plants that you can grow as well, flowers, all types of things. So definitely check out that link as well. Yeah, thanks. We hope to see everyone there. And, and yeah, we have got some fun new stuff this year and it'll, it'll be great to have people out for that. Any other last minute questions from anyone? I know I feel like I just learned so much, but yet I'm so excited to start my garden this year. All right, well, we just wanna give a quick reminder that our next event will be next Wednesday, getting candid with the candidates. So check our YPG um, website or our Facebook to uh, get more information on that. But Thank you, Megan, for joining us and telling us all these amazing things about plants. And thank you, everyone, for joining 